Very well. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I have never seen you. I'm stepping on your joke, by the way. Uh, yeah. So the, the presentation tonight is on a butterfly called Spiria coronis. Uh, as of late, you know, I was starting to get a, a little worried until David informed me that I've been infected with coronis virus. <laughs> All right, that's a collective moan. I prefaced it by blaming him. All right, so the deal is I didn't know how many people knew anything about Lord of the Rings stuff, but um, I just wanted to give myself the opportunity to declare myself a hobbit. <laughs> And there and back again is absolutely appropriate for this butterfly. And so we're basically going to talk about the seasonal movement of, of animals in general, and, uh, and, and this butterfly in particular, and their food, ad, uh, food plant adaptations that actually, you know, basically fold into the whole thing. In fact, you'll see that it's just a, one nice package. Okay, so it's really about this plant and an animal that wants to eat it. And when you think about that, the animal, you know, it's just a craven beast, you know, looking for, listing for food. This plant is amazing. Beautiful. Now, that plant, I mean, if you look at the leaves, you can see that they're actually succulent, right? I mean, those are, it's like a sedum violet, you know? Um, and, and this is the plant. This is the, the, the driver of this whole thing. So uh, you will be seeing more of this plant as time goes on. Okay, so I wanted to make sure that I gave uh, credit where it's due, and, and I, I forgot David. So um, basically, all of you have at one level or another participated in my efforts um, in one way or the other. Um, Dave James, of course, you know, he and I uh, wrote a paper. Oh, I can't believe I didn't, maybe I didn't include that. Oh. What is going on? This was fine just a minute ago until I started messing it up. There we go. Uh, yeah, I got this. I, I, this is what it looks like when I have it, you know. David James, Dave Nunnally, of course, everybody knows him. Caitlin, everybody knows him. And this Melanie Weiss person that keeps showing up. <laughs> These people have been instrumental over the last uh, four years, especially uh, bringing all this together. So, and I am grateful uh, for having uh, the company of people. And y'all don't know this because you just don't go around the world uh, of the United States and see uh, butterfly communities. but. You guys are great. The Pacific Northwest community of people is really cool. And I'm going to get everybody to try to go down to Corvallis uh, this October, and you get to meet the rest of the people, and you get to meet up with the Eugene chapter, and it's just a grand time. Last time, they had the, we caught Paul Hammond, and, and we were looking at, at, at fruit pictures um, the whole time, and he was the expert telling us, okay. So all creatures, and everybody knows this, um, all creatures exist in relationship to others. Herbivore plant relationships, however, can be pretty intimate. In this particular case, uh, the plant is, you know, Viola trinovata, which I like. And if you actually, oh, that's a piece of I think it, I got it, I got this. All right, you look at the leaves, they're kind of, they're kind of uh, triffid, you know, they, they're, they're, instead of being normal heart-shaped uh, Viola leaves, they're actually kind of, uh, you know, three-pronged. And that's uh, the trinovata. Um, this is sagebrush violet, everybody knows it is that. Okay, um, the sagebrush flats, rocky hillsides, uh, you know, with, with moisture, bloom time, April through May, because after that, it is hot. And that luscious plant you just saw, just can't handle it. This is the distribution of the uh, records from the Berg Museum uh, website. And you can kind of see it, it's uh, basically you slope of the Cascades. You know, there's other records a little deeper in the Columbia Basin, but, and this is a, a you know, I don't know anybody recognize this picture. This is the original from whence uh, our logo on the website came. Um, the, the goofus guy uh, with the, the, the hat on is, is me, but I think you might recognize a few of the other people. Uh, this is the kind of place, this is on top of the ridge above Schnebeli Cooley. This is the kind of place where this violet you know, prop, you know, does really well. That's my kid. And there's all these, these rocky, I mean, you know, I got this vista, and the reason why my kid's in there is because he paid me. But you, you, you have this, you know, foreground shot. And you can see, all right, it's kind of like, all right, this is really early. So, like, a lot of the flowers haven't even begun to bloom yet. But you look over the next hillside. It's like, oh, it's more of the same. And you look into the, it was hill after hillside, full of, of this violet um, in, in a habitat that, you know, soon will be toast. So, that's the main thing that we're, we're looking at when we, uh, when we look at, at, at these landscapes is that they're very rich. Uh, biotas that come to a very quick end because they're in places that just 
you know, won't support that over the course of the summer. I picked this one because it was like the last one. I think it was the same image. I just wanted to look at it on the big screen. But, this, you know, how many people have seen places like this in eastern Washington, you know, Kittitas Valley? Right. You know, we, we see these, you know, this is not unusual. All right. Oh, dude, what happened? Nothing. Well, someone didn't aim the, uh, the thing. Don't on me. All right. <laughs> Anyway, the, the violet is, uh, we're going to have other problems because I, you know, I fill flies. But anyway, the, the violet is a vernal plant. It's all above the ground presence is in, in April. You go out in April and May and you see it. It's gone in July. I know because I made the mistake of climbing one of these ridge tops and just to find this violet. And it was like 110 degrees, uh, you know, uh, the, the atmosphere sucked humidity out of you. So anyway, this, this is the place where, you know, if you're going to make it, you got to make it early. And, uh, and this is part of how it's able to do that. I mean, you know, that's a taproot. Most of that plant is actually below ground. And uh, we'll, we'll get to, to you know, the, the significance of that later on. All right. Some relationships are extremely tight uh, between you know, herbivores and plants, all right? Uh, like you know, pyrids, you know, pyrids will use a lot of brassicaceous plants. It doesn't really make any difference what genus, you know, this mustard, that one is fine. The same butterfly female will go from one species to the next without well, a qualm. The area is not fine. Who? Aliaria petiolata, um, a garlic mustard. Is oh, yeah, that, okay. So, like, it's always good to have you over. <laughs> <laughs> The butterfly food plant relationship that we're talking about tonight is tight. I don't know who put that other thing on. <laughs> All right, the herbivore is the uh, Coronis fertilary. And as far as I know, and as Dave Nunley knows, or as uh, uh, David James knows, the only plant it is ever using is this, this one plant. So that's pretty tight. Now this butterfly, I only put these images on there because I know you all know everything about, you know, Coronis fertilaries, right? <laughs> right? It's a... It, it, to me, it's a distinctive butterfly. And now, uh, to Melanie, it's becoming a distinctive butterfly because you're calling them, you know, at a 90, 95, 98% rate, all right? Well, I mean, take it from me, right? You heard the introduction, I knows. <laughs> so, uh, and this is uh, what I picked up because I think Caitlin said, I don't know, I, I might've got that from you, I don't know. It, it, it kind of showed a nondescript color. I like this color because it's like, is it tan, brown, and sometimes, huh? Olive. Olive? olive. Yeah. Oh, you're killing me. <laughs> I have to add that to my list now? Yeah. That's going to be a real long list. All right. So I got to go through this just because. Now, diapause, a period of suspended, you know, I, you don't know what diapause is, right? It can occur at any stage in the, in, in the cycle. Um, it's important to understand that, you know, in places where uh, th there is no limitation temperature or photo period wise, uh, there may be li uh, limitations in terms of moisture. So like in the tropics where you have, you know, a conducive environment for reproduction uh, and, and life cycle, uh, it might be too dry. So they shut down uh, for diapause there for different reasons. But the important thing is that all of the North American fertilaries, diapause, as a first instar larva just out of the egg. So if the egg is laid, the larva hatches and immediately goes into diapause, which, which strategy is, seems peculiar to me, all right? But nonetheless, that's the way it is. Can I hold this word? Yeah, with uh, you know, some small uh, remuneration, I'll give you actually a copy of the whole thing. We're talking nickel, nickels and dimes, what? They go into the ground? Um, well, it, it, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not going deep into the ground, but they're finding shelter, right? They have to find some place to be. John, huh? other sources say that they eat their eggshells. What? Fritz? Okay. The, the, the Himalayas are raising the kazoo. Okay, okay. Well, they, so they are eating something, which is even more bizarre, because if you eat your eggshell and you go into diapause, what if you have to poop? I thought you said that they shut it down. Well, they usually expel everything. They still before. eat. They'll expel everything right before going into the. There's so much we don't. <laughs> <laughs> or the chinos, you don't. I've had a lot of. Like, I've had a lot of. Like, 
<laughs> All right, so in the, lar in, in the spring, these larvae, uh, they break diapause you know, really early on and they, they start eating and, and they better because the time interval from commencement of eating to adult eclosion is less than two months. And at the end of that two month period, you're, you're entering hell. And, uh, so the, the, the violet, you know, of course, senesces rapidly and, uh, there's, and they're in a race to get to the end. Now, uh, the other thing it's important to, to recognize is that these things are emerging pretty much. We can see if they all come out from diapause, you know, as first instar larvae um, and begin, you know, feeding at about the same time in any given location, they're all going to develop pretty, pretty much in the same, uh, same area. That's what we see. I've only been at an emergence uh, uh, site well, maybe four times in all my 50 years. It's because you have to climb on top of ridges and it has to be the right time of year. And if you do it one week and they're not there, then you have to come back and do it again the next week. And that, that gets old. And, you know, like I'll have Melanie do that for me. From now on. <laughs> so, uh, Speria biology, plant phenology, environmental constraints. Uh, this is the, you know, uh, page from uh, uh, Nunley, or James and Nunley uh, detailing. I definitely would recommend you go on and take a look at that. Uh, you know, the, the biology is pretty straight. That's what you know. That's what butterflies do. They end up as a pupa and, and uh, you know, the adult. But we found out something. Spiria coronis has a highly circumscribed migratory behavior, and it's associated with this plant uh, to wit. Um, and, and we know this because that other guy and I got together and we did a paper. All right. And really, boy, it, that looks really. Official, doesn't it? <laughs> it must have been his choice for title. And this is uh, that that's what I was looking for earlier. This is the journal uh, that we published in. All right. So this is this is you know 2011. It's 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 not old news, but we've learned so much since. And and, and, and David he says, This could go on forever. I says, most good things do, you know. So we demonstrated that the uh spiria um features another form of diapause, and that's reproductive diapause. Um, and that is the cessation of oviposition behavior um, and, and, you know, in the females due to the delay in the ovarian development. And David shows, um, well, we'll get to that. Mating occurs primarily after they emerge, but it can occur all year long. We had a, 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 photo, a, a photo essay and a, a movie of a male female mating in uh, Kawichi, I think, or maybe uh, in that vicinity, like in late August and September. So the idea that these things, you know, do all the, the mating at one time, you know, may be erroneous. We think they, they actually can mate. And that explains why males are found all the way in the migration. Okay, so the, um, the idea that reproductive diapause means they're not laying eggs. So in this migration that they undertake, and we're about to talk about, uh, they're not laying eggs. They're on this journey, and they're not doing anything that's biologically useful except staying alive, which is too bad. All right. So, uh, oh yeah, and David uh, dissected, uh, you know, the ovary, uh, ovarian uh, uh, oviducts and, and looked at uh, the development. He's still got about uh, 300 uh, and frozen, and he says, "I'm going to get to that someday." And I said, "Well, I wouldn't worry about it unless you need some eggs for an, uh, a waffle or something." <laughs> So, and, and the other thing that's interesting is you can stop all of that by injecting them with juvenile hormone. Now, there are so many possibilities that you can imagine by injecting juvenile hormone into any conversation, but. <laughs> now, this, this is where we start to get technical, right? I mean, interesting. The, the food plant is a extremely juicy. I showed that already, right? That's a, I mean, if you're, you know, a, a frit, and you feed on violets, that's a violet that you'd love to target. Uh, but it's like very ephemeral. It's only a very, very, very small time of the year. And uh, there it is again. Oh, isn't that? Come on, I even want to eat that. <laughs> so we did extensive literature searches and, and communicated with our colleagues. Um, and we discovered that larvae of, of coronas all over its range, California, Colorado, Montana, uh, they are more susceptible than other uh, fertile areas uh, to desiccation. Uh, and furthermore, they, they break diapause earlier. So like when you're talking about these overwintering uh, first instar larvae that are coming out, you know, in probably March or maybe now, in February, or uh, there earlier. So they, what? Don't tell me what time it is. <laughs> 
so the, the point though is that um that they're they're fragile and this makes them susceptible to harsh conditions excuse me they have chosen a plant that lives in one of the harshest conditions that we have available to us in our state so what's this all about so what they do is they have this uh, huh Love this blind. yeah well yeah boy i hope i don't go blind <laughs> So the, the, this whole thing about, you know, what's going on is that it, maybe they could make it out there if, you know, if they had something to feed on, but they don't, you know, by the time they're emerging in, at the end of May, um, you know, that it's already toast and, and the, all the things that have bloomed or will bloom, have bloomed. It, 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 actually, it gets better in, in August and September when, the, um, you know, the uh, rabbit brush comes out. But so really, they don't have a nectar source. And. And really, if they wanted to stick around, they would have to lay eggs in a habitat that essentially is going to fry them. Fried eggs, get it? Um, and this is not a viable alternative. You know, this is not a viable strategy. All right. So, what do they do? They leave. That's what I do. You know, there's nothing for us here. Laying eggs is, you know, going to probably end up, you know, cooking everything. So that's not survival oriented strategy. One thing we could do is leave, and they do. Um, we now have documented that they close in the steps, migrate uphill. I say uphill. You know, they move to where there's nectar, which usually means uphill, uphill uh, elevationally, uh, in, a, in more music areas where there's flowers to provide the nectar. And since they're in reproductive bipods, they're not laying eggs long. Oops, what they do? And a twitch. Um, they, they're, they're nectaring, they're staying alive. So they're still in the game. Right now, they have emerged, they've moved, they're nectaring and they're going on. And uh, they do it in style. I mean, you tell me if you recognize any of these kinds of vistas, right? And Coronas is in all these places. I'll, I'll go over them again, all right? I, I just, I grabbed these off the net, but this is a perfect, you know, Corona's habitat at, at, at Natchez Loop or something like that, right? Yeah? So the morning folk also go to the diapause sometimes in the summer when it gets really hot. Yes. But doesn't it, um, does it, doesn't it sort of go into a barn or sort of rest during that time? Well, they could. You know where I find them most often? Huh? Underneath the willow copses. They'll be lined up on the on the on the branches. Uh, I found just hang there for weeks. They will sit there, yeah, yeah. But the but the coronas they're active. active. Yes. At yeah. a higher elevation. Well, the the morning cloaks. In order for them to do what coronas does, they'd have to move someplace, and then you know, it, it, coronas is doing this because hey, you know, the conditions are this great plant. I love it, but. It's a, you know, it's a, a, a relationship that has to be severed when it's just too hot. And uh, so they, they, they managed to, to, to solve this problem by moving away. We'll just keep going on. We'll get to the point where there'll be more questions, all right? Everybody knows what the monarch migration looks like, right? Um, it's, it's pretty well known and it's what we call latitudinal, right? Start south, move north. Uh, this map is probably out of date because uh, they update it every other month. but. This is approximately, um, you know, what, you know, what, what's going on with the monarch, all right? Um, the Cronus is altitudinal, and we're just getting to know and understand this, but we'll get, um, we'll get to, to that right now. This is records that we have from, from May, okay? Those little red dot, uh, yellow dots, can you see those? Okay, those represent all the records we have for the month of May in the state of Washington. Well, essentially, that's, uh, th th those are about when the butterfly is emerging. That basically represents the breeding area for this butterfly, okay? So this is, you know, um, another map going back to the one about the violets. Now, all right, I should have put them side by side, uh, maybe because I got spastic fingers, but you, you can see there's kind of this relationship between the food plant and the, and the butterfly. It's really pretty close. Well, or you can just t trust, trust me. But so at the range max, in other words, your maximum distribution, we can see just how far away from the breeding areas this butterfly gets, all right? So we'll do this several times so you don't have to uh, you know, feel like you're missing something. You see the difference between where they're breeding and where they, they end up, right? 
that's a pretty massive well, yeah, local expansion of range. It's not like what the monarch does, but it's so much more interesting than the monarch. So it's all there. All you <laughs> All right, early in the year, the emerging of the step, we got this whole thing going again. They expanded the range like that, and then returned to the step. That's okay, we'll do that. I, I, I know there's going to be a lot of repetitive slides here, but there's a reason for it, and that's because I lose my way a lot. All right, so that's where they start. That's where they end up maximally, and that's where they end up at the end of the year. Now, this was like, absolute documented evidence that there was this thing going up and this other thing coming back down it wasn't until the last decade that we actually were able to observe um the, the butterflies uh you know over positive and this is because we're talking late august and september on those very same hilltops that we were talking about that are furnaces and believe me they're not cooler in august and september all right this is a miserable place to actually call your butt out to, to look at. It's really hard, um, you know, to, you know, and there's no guarantee that you're going to see anything anyway. But Merrill and, and I and Lars Crabo and a few other people have, you know, gone to the trouble. And we found them. We found these females fluttering around and they lay eggs on dirt. Ah, remember those the violets that had the big long roots, you know, we were looking at earlier? And, and, and people, you know, said, well, big roots there. Those roots are intact. The above uh, uh, ground portion of the plant is, is, is gone. It's, it's toast. It's been blown away. But that, that root system is still intact, and they have chemicals. I assume, wouldn't you think? Doesn't everything have chemicals? No. Yeah. That's a joke. It's bad when I have to tell you, though, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so they come back out and they lay eggs on the dirt. And we've seen enough Fritz laying eggs on dirt now to feel pretty comfortable with that as a strategy. It works and it's repeated and hallelujah, right? So um, now what's this? What does it say up there? I can't read it from an angle. Maybe I read it. Oh, the October records. Yeah, that's just an extension. I mean, we, dude, there's not many butterflies that occur in October, right? So we have you know, these in October. All right. So we're going to do this whole thing. But this is the this is the, the the total distribution, and this is May, June, July, August, September. Yeah, you see how that goes again? I mean, that it's like wow. This is actually that's the total. Okay, boing, 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 boing. Pretty cool, and y'all get to be a part of it. I mean. And we can say, yeah, we got a spider, a coronas. What do you have? Monarch, <clears throat> you know. <laughs> anyway. All right. So the combination of life history traits, the female diapause, the reproductive diapause, larval susceptibilities to desiccation, and the premature breaking of larval diapause, and, and really, this whole presentation really wasn't about the butterfly at all. It's, it's the plant. And the ideal food plant. Again, I mean, come on, look at that thing. Oh, you you want to make a salad? I wouldn't do that, by the way, they're toxic. Right? And by the way, you know, fritillaries are closely related to heliconians, which are known, you know, toxic, um, belong to these extensive mim mimicry rings in South, America, South and Central America. We haven't proved it, but I'll bet you that fritillaries are toxic too. So I'm going to eat one. <laughs> It worked last time. I ate a monarch and I regretted it. Conspire to give us a spectacular migration, a spectacular migration. Now let's you know look at an, an, another example. You know, of late, you know, we and, and have seen a lot of Nymphalus California. California tortoise shells is big, big news in in our state and in the Northwest generally. So you know, we we did this this same analysis of a butterfly that's expansive. And, and, and it has rapid range change, which is what we're really talking about. But it doesn't include a return migration. It, is, it just goes anywhere it ends up um, advantages to survive or not. So it's really kind of a suicide butterfly, you know, because it only survives, it doesn't seek a place. You know, I need to find a little nook and cramp. No, they just find themselves in Seattle and one day it gets a little colder. It's like, oh, they get out of the rain and they find some place and they survive or don't. Uh, oh, what's that? Oh, ah, you did. So this is confirmation. 
I can write that down. Where was it? You saw this. Uh, that's your place. Yeah. So um, this is the um, total records of that butterfly for our state. These are the records in January and February. And um, it's not a lot of people out looking for butterflies in January or February, unless you're a WABA member and, uh, and, and, and or Bob Pyle. You see that little red? Uh, yeah, that, that down where he lives. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, we got, we, we have not yet, and still have it after all this time, still don't have a December record for the butterfly. And I'm thinking it's like, you know, the butterflies have some sense, right? In, 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 in January and February, they're coming out, it's like, yeah, it's getting better, right? In November, it's like, <laughs> it's getting worse. I'm going to go into uh, retirement. Right? So, um, and then, you know, the, the range, as you can see, is expanding. And, you know, it's like, Again, you know, the, the individual records aren't as dense uh, because they're not collected together. But by the time you get into October and November, you know, so basically, you know, what did I do? I screwed it up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, we'll go back. You're raising the hand? All right. You know, like, if you watch a monarch's migration or somewhere like an Oregon, they tend to be going a particular direction. They're going a lot further than these guys go. Not these guys, but the coronas. Are. Yeah. When you're out there collecting the coronas, do you see, tend to see them flying in a particular direction? No, and the interesting thing is, yeah, we do. Actually, Melanie and I saw this up at uh, Reister Creek this last year. You know, we got to a place where it's way above where any uh, fritz were emerging at the time. I, what do we see? Echo azures or something like that flying up there? And just a few of the, the fritz coming by, right? And they were kind of moving in one direction. And, and it was, the main reason was there was no reason to, to dawdle. Uh, fritz, when they get to where there's a nectar source, they'll stop and they'll be just like any other member of the fauna. You won't be able to see that they're actually moving unless you document you know, their occurrence at that site over time, right? And then you can see, well, no, they came and then they left, right? So um, this is the total, uh, Total records, right? So you can see, you know, start small and they get bigger. It's and a it's, series going from, I see it going. Yeah, we're, we're starting, now this is total records, right? Okay. This is January, February. February, okay. Right. It's at the top of the screen, you can see that's a step. Right, right. And March, you can't read. So that's part of why. Oh, that's yeah, right. that's right. We part got. why I couldn't follow what yeah, right? the screen it's, was. This was a dropper's attempt to hijack my attempt yeah. to be lucid. Damn. Any excuse I can find for lack of lucidity. So as you're going through the, you know, the, you see that, yeah, they're all in the mountains still, but then they start showing up down in Seattle and whatnot. So um, by the time that you've gone to the, the, the maximum of distribution, it could be virtually any place. And, you know, the presence of a food plant is non-essential. Its relationship to the food plant is like, Let's go until we find some. And like in Oregon, this means that they go to the Pacific uh, Ocean, sometimes die in drifts on the beach, and either go north or south. I had uh, one year, two years ago, uh, yeah, two years ago, I got a report from Ron Lyons. He said it was most peculiar. I went to some town on the Oregon beach, on, on the Oregon coast, and I was monitoring north, and I you know, saw these these tortoise shells and they were moving north along the beach. And so I, I looped around, went back to Clahatchee or whatever, and then I went south and there was all these tortoise shells and they were moving south. It's like, yeah, that's mainly because they can't go over the ocean. I mean, it's like, you got a, a limited option, right? So um, there is a reason to see, you know, this butterfly, um, the Spiria Corona, Spiola, trying to rot a system as really a remarkable one. Uh, I, I've worked with a, a number of different people all across uh, Europe and Asia. Some people indicate to me that there's probably other butterflies in the, in the fertility group that have similar strategies, but they haven't been uh, noticed. So I talked with Steve Kohler. Am I all right with time? Okay. Um, I talked with, because you were the one that told me 155 slides was gonna kill everybody. Um, Steve Kohler is uh, doing what I do for Washington. He's doing it for Montana. And I just talked with him today. And I said, you know, 
Do you, you think that this is going on in, in, in Montana? You know, Steve is kind of a slow and deliberate talker. And as you might imagine, a conversation with me <laughs> is discordant. And, but he says, you know what? I'm going to have to look at my data. Just before I left to come here tonight, he says, well, you know, JP, I think maybe there is a correlation. So uh, sometimes you have to look for things. Sometimes you discover them. And then sometimes they bite you. But, so, I, I mean, honestly, I, I, you know, I'm, in, I'm a Washington boy. Uh, monarchs are an invasive uh, pest on milkweeds, you know. <laughs> and I think personally the USDA should take action to um, protect milkweeds' interests. I mean, after all, they're vital nectar resources, and we can't have these things coming from outside our state. I should run for office. Huh? <laughs> Build a wall. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. So anyway, that's it. And I, I got time to spare, so we got time for questions, which we would have taken anyway, whether we had time. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, this is not about Corona. You mentioned that the, the uh, California Florida shell would not fly over the ocean. Who? You, you were talking about the uh, California Florida shell not flying over the ocean. Right. Do you know how far? Butterflies might fly over water? Well, look, it's, it's hard to say. First of all, uh, the pygmy blue, do you all know what the pygmy blue is? As you might guess from its name, it's very small, right? And uh, it occurs, you know, widely throughout the New World. Well, recently, it's, uh, well, recently in the last two decades, it's been discovered in uh, United Arab Emirates. And it's expanding its range there. Well, how did it get there? Well, it probably came over on a you know transport plane. It could have too, you know. But uh, the it's two relatives. And Graffidium is the genus name. It's two relatives are already African. So the idea that you know small butterflies can travel long distances is not so much a matter of wing power, as in you know the mass to surface air uh, surface uh, ratio being. So what are you doing? Chatting online. You are actually so uh, getting being small and getting blown around is is a pretty way to go. So I don't know Hawaii's got a lot of butterflies. Some of them were important. Some of them got there on their own power. So I think it's different with each butterfly. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, among the numerous Christian elves, they also The monarchs? Well, they have no sense. I mean, you know, so. They have to set out across the slate, but that means Well, that's not, yeah, that's kind of like what they do when they start off in Mexico. They just set out and go. I mean, they're an intrepid butterfly. I don't really mean to denigrate them. Um, I, they're amazing, you know, creatures. They are. Yeah. <laughs> but but they're poisonous and they made me throw up, so I, I'm not real happy Why about it. <laughs> you know how to slander somebody. <laughs> That's right. Washington Post representative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ma'am. So, Cherry, another, I also saw monarchs what? in Pensacola, Florida, that kept out on the dock, and they were just heading out and right Whoa. off the dock and ah. down to the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so uh, I just got a question from who? Al. Al. And it's uh, concerning, uh, is anyone uh, tagging these things? Yes, we've been working on it for a long time. I, not me, actually, I'm far too busy. Uh, no, uh, uh, the, the uh, Kawichi Conservate, uh, Conservancy, and a number of people uh, have been doing that for a long time. In fact, one of the uh, the, the photographs of, of the uh, a mating uh, a, a pair in, in, in September was taken by one of these people. So they do a lot of tagging. Remarkable thing is we haven't got any of them recovered. None. Well, it's not too hard to understand why they're following drainages, right? So um, they, they go up these drainages and they get on the adjacent ridge tops. I mean, you really have to... I uh, hope that the drainage you're in would be a one that intersects with, you know, one of your transects or you're not going to see those things. Also, um, I think the number of people versus the, uh, the, the territory, uh, you know, that you know, they'd have to cover. 
uh, Marx, they do have a way of coming together in a, a parts of their natural history. So they, they will be, um, you know, coming to like a seven year old or, you know, the, you know, whatever that, or Kamel, whatever it is in Mexico. So that, that, that does, you know, anytime you draw things together, Nectar does that, but then, you know, on a grander scale, you know, specific topographic features. But we have not yet recovered any tag specimens. Uh, we're going to try. We, we think maybe it'd be better if we actually injected them with not juvenile hormone, but radioactive material. Right? And then we could use spy satellites to track their movements, right? <laughs> no? <laughs> That was worth one try. Any more there? No, none from online yet. All right. How about this, Chuck? To get back to Coronas. You gotta get out of my chair, man. For some reason, this, this, the way it might be, I have a hard time wrapping my head around it. So if you were going to explain to like a kindergarten student what is going on here, like in just a couple, in a few sentences, what would you say? I say, um, eat your breakfast and go out and play. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. You know? Because that's what it is, you know. It's like the 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 whole the whole purpose of 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 the larva, for example, is is to you know eat. And you know, when I just talked about the availability of uh, the resources, um, the short term availability. Now it's true they're lush resources, and that's why this whole thing happened. If it was a nasty old violet, you know, Spiraea coronis would find something else to do. But it is a spectacular plant. And so to, to be able to exploit that resource, they had, you know, to um, in, in get out of Dodge or else they'd fry there. Now, there are no other uh, fertile areas in that area. It's not like that it, it, they're, you know, especially fragile. Really nothing is using that plant except this butterfly. And that means to me that that's what you call coevolution, right? Um, it's a, a partnership. I, I don't think it, you know, really benefits the plant, um, but I, I don't know that for sure. Um, the, the 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 leaving is is really important. I, I did want to say something, and you didn't notice it, so I, I'm not going to make it real. What I do? Oh, you didn't do anything. All right, I didn't do anything. You know that's the problem. I got to do something. All right, go back to uh, way back when. Okay, now anybody see some two little yellow dots down there in the blue mountains? Yeah. All right. Nobody asked me about that. Are they going? Are they migrating from the Cascades? No. Do you know where they're coming from? I talked with Hammond, my brother, in um, in Oregon. He says, "Well, I kind of think that they're coming from southeastern Oregon. They're doing the same thing in Oregon they're doing here, but then it's in another dimension, right? We get them here. They're not resident. They're not living in the Blue Mountains. They just got there." So that's one of the things that, that we um, always have to be aware of is that the capacity for any organism uh, to, you know, basically adapt to almost any environment um, that they're facing, especially in the Northwest, where we have for at least, you know, since the glacial uh, periods, um, had to, every organism that's here has had to encounter fluctuating climates, you know, rapid and catastrophic changes in, in the, in, 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 in your habitats, you know, the Brett's floods in eastern uh, you know, Washington, the various uh, Mazama explosions and other volcanic eruptions. So, you know, life is uncertain. So you need to have a, a, a capacity to adjust to all of those uncertainties as, as they may occur. And in this particular case, I mean, Corona's stuck rich. Corona's said, ah, me likey this plant. So what do I have to do to make this work? And it's really easy because what does it have to do? It has to leave. And there's not coincidentally huge meadows full of flowers uphill from these populations. So they basically have it pretty much made. And they're moving into a place where there's plenty of uh, things for them to eat. Um, and they, they can follow those flowers all the way up to um, you know the top. Well, I they haven't got quite up to Camp Muir yet, but they're at you know six to seven thousand feet in the Cascades, no problem, right? They are camped here. No, they, I don't think they've been recorded. Yeah, yeah. My son saw. No, tortoise shells he saw. Oh, 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 yes. I'm right. Sorry. Yeah. Don't give me a heart. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and and so that in the but the thing is, come back down, 
and they lay eggs in the dirt. Now that's clever. That is really skillful. Um, I'm not sure that I would like to be endowed with uh, the capacity to smell as something as ephemeral as violet organic compounds, because we live in a society where there's many, many more of those kinds of smells that'd be overwhelming. But for a female, you know, Coronas fertilis, she's just you know out there on her own lonesome in in uh, August and September, and, and and there's really you know she knows where she's looking for, it, and when she smells it, she's found it. And I would say, okay, two things I wanted to say about this year. Another wet spring, we're going to have a boom year for, for Coronas this year. But also, and this is something you should think about as you go through April and May, last year we had a wet spring, right? I don't know if you guys noticed, but there was a, a lot of brassicaceous plants, you know, the, uh, the mustards, you know, the, everything from the, the Bacaria, Arabis things to the uh, Sicimbrium and, and whatnot. All of these things did spectacularly well last year. So all of the whites that came emerged out of last year's root, you know, they didn't have an enhanced previous season. They came out and they're just hanging on like they normally do. But they came out into a world that was full of food plants. So what do you think they did? Well, they laid eggs all over that. And those larvae probably had a high survival rate because as you probably remember, last year was not a a really hot early spring. And these plants, you know, got you into June and July. It was great. This spring, there's going to be, I mean, the whites are going to be gone, though. So, okay? You're going to see more marbles and orange tips and, and beckers and sesimbria. I'm predicting this, right? So I'm going out on a limb, but it's not much. I mean, I got 50 years into this. I kind of know, you know, that it's going to be a big year uh, for the for whites. Same thing with these, you know. Uh, they came out, oh, that's great. Oh. Violets are good. Let's eat. Let's go. And, and they're going to do the return. And this would be another big year. Last year was a big year for Corona sightings. Uh, we all all partook in that. We started seeing them early and, and, and kept seeing them late. Yeah. We've got one right in the middle of Thurston County. What's that about? <laughs> See, I poked, I poked them once, once too many times. <laughs> All right, um, that's at uh, a famous locality. Uh, you know, it's at the Rocky Prairie. Now it's a preserve. You know, it's a East 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 Preserve, something like that. Uh, it was a traditional site for you know ninety years before that. But uh, that was my record. Okay. And, yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, they really don't belong, belong in Mount Rainier either. But if you think about, okay, so you get the Mount Rainier from you know Bandage, all right? How much different is it to, you know, wander down out right here and end up in, in Rocky Prairie? Um, I sampled the specimen myself. I caught it. I knew it was different from, you know, the beginning. It was all kind of ratty and everything because there's remnants flying around. They're all brand spanking fresh. So, yeah, that's, it's an example of like, um, well, the st stochastic process basically says, you know, you follow that bell curve out, right? We all look at the, the, the you know, the tails and but those tails, you know, Nope. <laughs> yeah, right. It, it, so that's what kind of year was that? That was a normal year. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, notable in any way. Really. Was, it, was it summer or was it fall? Oh, no. The what time of year? Yeah, yeah. yeah it was late July. Oh. Yeah. Could you put the September map up? And um, is that going to be. So whoop, whoop. What? You get it? That's the right. You got it. You got it. So the, the females are coming down to lay eggs in the dirt and they can find whatever it is they're looking for. How about the males? The males, are the males? males are useless bags of sperm. They accompany the females on this uh, whole journey simply so that they're available for impregnation. I was, wasn't going to talk about this because it's kind of disgusting. <laughs> but Put my hand down. <laughs> what was he going to say? No, no, I don't want to interrupt this. All right, <laughs> you may actually. Um, when, when, uh, when butterflies mate, now males invest a certain amount of themselves in the process. It's not they're just passing sperm, they're, they're passing a spermatophore, which is proteinaceous and is a contribution to the female's welfare, right? So in a way, you know, he is in earnest and well, he's over ardent, okay? And the female has to make the choice of the male. But the male also is like, well, this is my contribution to the future. So I'm going to help my female get along by adding a little proteinaceous substance to the uh, spermatophore. However, in the course of events, uh, you know, uncertainty plays a role. 
and this this is uh, almost always true with everything in, in spiraria coronis it could be that a female on her path to greener pastures just you know, ends up coming on empty maybe the the flowers aren't emerging properly or they're not any emerging or uh, bloomed yet and so she says i am at a protein deficit i need to digest the spermatophore and then maybe even the sperm well that leaves her unmated right hey that's where males come in that's what we're for no see what i mean it, it, it gets out of hand real quick <laughs> so the males follow the females just so that there's always a potential mate is that okay all right you're a troublemaker chris kathy has a uh, comment here oh ah. do you want to read it for the for the group or Ah, oh, Viola Tri Nirvana is documented from the counties south of the Blue Mountains in Oregon, but not the ones on the border. Oh, yeah. Interesting. I did not know that, of course. I mean, I hate to make a list of all the things I don't know. I'll let you do that. <laughs> not sure about where the Tri Nirvana has been found in Lincoln County, but it has. Yeah, I, I knew that. So, can I speculate? Hell yeah. <laughs> Speculation. Um, I suspect that, you know, as in most things, what works, you know, you don't fix. So uh, if you look at the, the range maps as uh, they are presented currently, uh, we had a record from Lincoln County at one time and we were never able to verify it. And Melanie, bless her soul, went out and collected a what or, or, or got about 15 images or 16 images of Calippi, right? Oh, yes. Right. Oh my gosh, I kept wanting a corona. I know, I appreciated yeah. that. That's why I put yeah, your name on there. Yeah. This one. <laughs> right. Well, more than you have tried, okay? But they just really don't seem. I, I, my first experience, okay, I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to mm. bear a little bit of my soul, right? May 31st, 1965, Grand Coulee. Uh, it was one of my first trips over uh, to Eastern Washington, and we got there in the middle of, of the night and set up camp. And I woke up in the morning to the Grand Coulee. Now I don't know, you know, I was a you know a 14 year old, so I'm looking out at this world that you know, it was kind of new to me. And I woke up to a wall of rock, and I said, "Holy cow!" You know, it's like 500 feet tall. And I looked east and west, or down north and south, whatever. And it went. It was like you know the Great Wall of China forever. You know. And, and, and my stepdad said, yeah, well, turn around. And I looked, There's another one. I mean, the Grand Coulee is just this amazing thing. And that's a place where, uh, you know, Coronas are, are native and, and, and recurrent. We can, we can go there regularly and see that. Lots of vile work trying to rot on the rim, uh, rim rock above and the, and, and, and the table ends, et cetera. So that makes sense. But I've gone east from there. Yeah, we're looking. I've been in Ferry County. I've been, you know, through um, Ponderay County and Stevens County, up and down uh, Curlew Lake Valley, et cetera, et cetera. I've looked at all these places, and you know I have, but we haven't got that. And no one else has either, really. The one place that was problematic was um, in, in Lincoln County, and uh, I would not rule that out. It's just too close to not be possible. And also, one of the things about um, evolution, you know, ev evolutionary processes is that you know, and, and an uncertain universe is that, you know, you never, um, you know, uh, you, opportunities present themselves sometimes and you take advantage of those opportunities. So yeah, I can see, uh, you know, spreading east. Yeah. You found the violet up in those counties, just not the butterfly yet? Um, I've not found the violet either, but okay. see, the thing is that for my purposes, it's not important whether they're breeding there. Is it is that where they go? So like, to me, you know, if you were to go from, say, Grand Coulee, North, well, I think that's maybe where the Moses Meadows populations are coming from, you know, because they're in Southern Okanagan County, and that's not really in the line of fire where all the other populations are. So, I mean, ferry, it's like, okay, why well, couldn't they fly the ferry county? They wouldn't be breeding there. It wouldn't have to be the, the food plant there. It just had to be a place that would provide the available nectar. Chris Cathy comments, I only know the distribution of, yeah. of the plant because I'm sitting here with Mr. Google and found it on Turner Photographic's website. Um, and our CS website shows distribution further south. No, you, you know, you should never say that. First, taking it from somebody who- what, uh, Mr. Google? Huh? You shouldn't say Mr. Google? 
Well, no, no, you, that, that you in fact used an alternative, because I, I thought he was truly brilliant, you know? Um, <laughs> I, 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 is it Keith? Right? Uh, well, whoever, it was uh, a, you know, a brilliant insight. It was great. It added the conversation. It was stuff I didn't know, you know? And, and the fact that he found it online could have remained, it, um, you know, uh, private. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? You know what would be kind of cool is to find in a migration like this that is, much less uh, it's barely starting. Like you can see this happening just barely. Well, we may be looking at those things, but they're hard to distinguish when they're just initiating, right? I mean, you know, maybe not nothing as, as dramatic as occurring out in the step, but the idea that, that butterflies move, I mean, this is general knowledge. I mean, there's some that move more than others. You know, checker spots like the Taylors can be very localized and colonial, but, um, you know, like fritillaries, um, well, some of them are pretty local too, but others like Zerini, they just go everywhere all the time. So um, it's sometimes hard to discern what you're observing in nature. I mean, it, everybody collected coronas throughout all these ranges. That's how we built this record, this database. And they didn't always see what was happening because it takes a while, you know, to, to sort it out. Um, I, I'm always thankful to uh, David James for, um, you know, having uh, the, you know, the Give me the opportunity to cooperate with him on the matter. You know, uh, he had you know insights and, and and technology that I did. You know, the uh, juvenile hormone thing was I was totally cool when he told me about that. I said, "Oh, I want me some juvenile hormone," because <laughs> I sort of act like a juvenile anyway. Maybe I just need to stimulate that a little more, huh? Well, you're only going to have a few more shots because they're going to tell me I have to leave. Aha. <laughs> Could you show us on the photos of the adults? What makes it coronas and not the other? No, no, I can't do it. <laughs> what makes you think I have that capacity? <laughs> okay. I've, I've heard you it. Yeah, that's it. Way to go, Melanie. You got <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, Melody, you just were there all by yourself, and now you have to tell everybody how the coronas are different from the others. There is no easy way. There, there just is. I'm, and I'm certainly not the one to, 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 to do that. Um, all right, we'll look at that one, okay? What we talk about, um, if I'm going to dispense my wisdom. I'm so sorry. It's, that was comical. I mean, as a phrase, it was humorous. But So this is a, a the, the, the ventral surface of a, a specimen lying there. It's, um, that what we talk about all the time on the ventral hind wing is the disc. That's the area to the base of the main row of spots, which is what the post median spot band. The silver spots is three at the uh, near the front fore margin and three near the hind margin, and there's kind of a break in the middle. All right, that's the post median band. So everything basal to that is called the disc, and then that the, the light um, band that's outside of that, uh, they call it, they have a name for that too. Um, let me think. Post disco band? <laughs> submarginal band. Yeah. Well, I would call this submarginal spots, but the band, I don't know. Whatever. You can make up. That is not, um, I have not found it very useful. Other people have. So what I do is I get, my problem is I learned all this stuff when I was like 13. And I learned it by, you know, building the collections and, you know, spending the, the decades. By the time I was 30, you know, if you ask me how to tell these things apart, you know, I'd say no, but you can, you know, give it to me and I'll identify it for you. And, and you know, I've talked with Paul Hammond and other people. It's a similar problem. You, when you know something from a gestalt, or as the bird people call it, the, the jizz, giz, jizz, jizz. When you learn something that way, that's secret knowledge. <laughs> you cannot bestow it upon someone. You have to have them... Generate don't now. I have seen this happen. Melanie is ace. Um, I remember. Ah. Did, <laughs> let me do the talking here. Right. Um, she came up to the museum and she was in the nurse, wanted to look at all these, you know, uh, butterflies. And, and then, you know, it was, it's a sterile thing. I mean, pendant butterflies are not as beautiful as the, uh, you know, the real thing. There's no question about it. But um, it's really hard to dissect a photograph. So, like, there's a limitation there, too. She had a chance to look at all these things, and, and it was like, I don't know, was it two or three weeks before we went out on the Reister, uh, the, the, the Reister Creek uh, lava trip? 
something, sometime after that anyway. And so we were up at um, Haney Meadows or something like that, and somebody inevitably brought, you know, a, a fertile area over. Huh? Melanie! <laughs> and she did. She called. I mean, the bottom line was she called. And, and, and since that time, see, the whole thing is nothing breeds success like success. I mean, you know, once you've been able to identify some butterflies for a while, then you're able to do it more regularly. But just to show you how nasty things can be, is that that's a female, right? So it has a whole different wing shape. And I think it generally... Huh? Why? <laughs> That's implying that you you seem to know more about it than me. You talk about. It. That's what you're saying. <laughs> well, okay. This is okay. Look at the hind wing there. It's angular. Uh, what? That's rounder. Do I have the uh, the the gizmo? The pointer. Is there a pointer? No pointer. Oh, okay. You have a finger. You can use. It's oh, that doesn't work either. Use your finger. All right. This is the uh, the hindwing. See how it's round, as opposed to you know more angular. You see that at, at the bottom there? I can fall over for you. Um, it's it, it's at a point, right? If you go back. Ha. Okay, I get that, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right there. See that wing comes down there, it comes down there, it's at a, a little point. So right? there's an angle there that's different from what? It's different from your mama. <laughs> okay, different from the female. See how the outer margin is rounder and it comes, oops. It comes to. I mean, if I just said rounder, doesn't that get to get you there? Which one is rounder? This one right here. That's rounder. Am I wrong? Is it not rounder? Sorry, I think about this right here. Yeah, it's more than a ninety degree angle. The male is more plus or minus ninety degree angle. Circle. Then, if you look at this one, where it's. Melody, you're Shakes, it's it's you know, I always feel like I've succeeded when everyone's bickering in the crowd or, or there's talking and I know it's not bickering. Right. That's good, good. Oh, that, yeah. I can dress it like that, that, and that, kind of like a breakdown like that. And then the other one is more like this. This is about the yeah, there you go. All right. So now uh, you got uh, two females on the bottom. No, that's not true. They're all females. Yeah. <laughs> Which one? The male or the female is the rounder? No, female has a round. Dude, come on, bro. Come on. Females are always rounder. That is Ah, exactly. See, I mean, it, it, there's some principles that, you know, uh, belie actual explanation because I don't think there is anyone, but they just seem to be so, you know. All right. These are males. Yeah. Okay, I, they're all males. Yeah, these are all males. Yeah. yeah totally, you got it. I totally see what you're saying. Well, yeah, you know, you're predisposed, though, you know. All right. Uh, is everyone else kind of seeing that? So, where's the females? Can right. you get them closer? No. Oh. The, no. Those are all females. This is a photo period, a Photoshop, right? I mean, uh, what do you have? PowerPoint. Do you know how to increase the, the PowerPoint? Okay, well then I'm not going to try because I'd probably blow the machine up. Now, is everyone, um, you know, that's online, are they seeing these things too? Man, this is probably giving them a headache. <laughs> There's definitely more options. Right. The other ones, there's right. Someone came in with the chat. I can just describe it. It's more like that. Oh. Still the same. Still the same. All right. Okay, so um, the, the wing shape, I had never thought of as, as critical, but you know, it's useful yeah. to help you figure males and females apart. And sometimes when you learn uh, males and females, you'll see that males and females can be different looking. They're not horribly distinct uh, in this species. But getting to the disc, 
the, the ventral hind wing disc color. Um, that is a peculiar color that, because it's peculiar, kind of helps you figure out that it's coronas. Uh, there's there's uh, three fertile areas in our state that have very distinctive uh, disc colors, and they're distinctive um, for more than just the color itself, but for the fact that it's hard to describe. Um, you know, that, that, that color is kind of a, a beige, tan, olive, buff. <laughs> I mean, I could keep going. I got a list of them. Uh, sometimes with green over the top. I mean, so it's a, it, it's, it has a distinctive um, uh, appearance that once you've seen a number of them, um, then you become familiar with that. It's like, well, it's not Zarini because Zarinis are, you know, too orange or reddish, right? Um, and it's not a Calibi because Calibis are more green. Now, it's true that some Coronas will have some green in them, but you can't just say the presence of green means something. It's a green in combination with all the other things. Furthermore, um, I can usually call uh, Coronas uh, on the wing from a dorsal shot. And that's because, like, I'm really old, and I've been doing this for a really long time. But it's because you've seen so many. Uh, coronas tend to be, like, you look at the middle, the middle one in this image, the dorsal um, of that middle uh, specimen, how it's kind of, like, tawny. You know, and instead of being reddish, and even the others are, are, are more of a, a yellowy orange than a, a, a reddish orange. Uh, when you're in a field where there's things like Hedaspes and Zerinis flying around with uh, Coronas, you know, the Coronas, you know, they kind of stand out. Now, Calippes also do, uh, but they're different in a different way because they, you can kind of see through their spots. The, the silver spots on the, on the hind wing kind of show through. But the problem is, and this is a problem for everybody everywhere all the time. There's no single character that works all the time. In fact, I, I would suspect in, in, in fertile areas that um, if you had seven characters, you're doing good if you get four of them that will help you line up because the other three might be you know, quasi or, or indiscernible. And this is double so when it's just a photograph. I mean, that's the biggest problem. Like if somebody takes a picture, uh, let's see here, uh, that picture, that, so I'd like to see the dorsal image on it. Well, you're just out of luck, right? You're not going to see a dorsal in that. So um, there are going to be a sufficient number of, of uh, individuals, uh, even in the collection, which are unidentifiable. And the guy that, you know, basically is currently and has been the dean of North, North American fritillaries is Paul Hammond, which if you guys go down to Corvallis next year, you'll get to meet, you know, this is going to be a great adventure. Um, and he says, well, you know, there's times when I look at some of these butterflies and I think, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, they, they don't normally hybridize to any degree, so a hybrid would be really rare. But uh, Lars Crable brought me a specimen one time from like 1985 or eight. No, no, it must have been 90, uh, 91, somewhere in there, that he caught down in uh, 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 Rocky Prairie, the very same Rocky Prairie. And looked at it, and it was like, wow, this is, it looked like a, a Spiria a Zerini Bremner, a Bremner's checker, or a silver spot. But there was something about it that was like way too big, right? So I picked it up, turned it over, and I said, uh oh. It was a hybrid between a, uh, a, a Great Spangled and, and uh, a Bremner's. Um, it, you know, it's pretty clearly that. Um, Bremner's, is that a. Uh, Zerini. Thank you. Yeah. I love it. Somebody said, Rounders, what's that stuff? Give me the scientific name. Hoorah. Right. There's one. All right. Any more questions? Am I done? Wait, well, thank you guys for uh, <laughs> this is good. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, we're going to do the raffle now, and John will be the uh, ticket reader. Oh, I just lost my voice. I don't know. <laughs> And if anyone wants that PowerPoint, um, I've made it available. I have it on a Dropbox and I can send it to you if you want. Um, the reason why is because of all the.